This is Think Like a Genius. Tread the line of cognitive psychology, neuroscience, persuasion, and so much more than gray matter. Let's dive in as we fall into a world of intrigue. And now, Think Like a Genius with your host, Lance Vantanar. So hi, thank you very much for coming on the uh, podcast and agreeing to an interview. I'm actually really happy that you're on because we've known each other for quite a while and I've been watching, you could say, your progression in your coaching business and also your, uh, you could say, your JV coaching mentorship program and also your sure. the, the things that you've been involved in. But the one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on the podcast was your background and your story and your, your insights that you provide people with your mentorship and your training and also the, the amount of the value that you share in your Facebook groups is, is phenomenal. So you. can you provide people a bit more about your background, where you came from and how you approach things uh, from a, you could say, a, a thinking perspective? Sure, I'll do the quick sort of fast track um, uh, rather than the old, uh, you know, 45 minute hour yeah. sort of introduction. Uh, yeah, I originally I started um, as an, uh, trained as an accountant many, many years ago and I worked in one of the top five accountancy firms and spending time there, um, I realized that that wasn't really for me. It wasn't really my calling. So mm. I left a, a very high paid job and basically set up my own business uh, back in, in 1997, 98. And I had an internet marketing consultancy, which we went out to a lot of uh, companies, dot-com companies, VC companies, just basically um, advising them on how to use this new thing called the internet, which launched back in sort of 96, 97, 98. And then I bought that uh, a successful consultancy only to, to lose that in early 2000 when the dot-com bubble burst. And we had Y2K as well. Mm. And then I basically, I did what everyone's doing right now in this current economic climate. I pivot. I had a pivot and I basically restructured myself and I went into the online training business and I built a very successful online training company um, to eight figures, uh, which I sold uh, a majority stake in 2006 to uh, a large IT group in the UK. And then um, in 2008 was basically my exit strategy to exit from the business. And 2008, we had the dreaded recession. And because my um, training company was owned by a larger group, uh, they went bust in 2008 during the last recession and I ended up losing everything. So I basically went from being a multimillionaire to totally broke. And then I set myself a challenge uh, to make a million dollars in uh, in 12 months um, in 2009 after the recession. And I managed to uh, do one JV deal, uh, which took me 30 days to complete. And I made just over $1.5 million with that deal. And that basically got me back on my feet uh, mm. in 2009. After that, the rest is history. Um, I, I became a sought after motivational speaker and trainer uh, and coach. And I traveled the world for, for years, um, uh, teaching people how to use the leverage of joint ventures and strategic partnerships to basically make money out of nothing. Mm. And uh, that's what I've been doing ever since. And um, in 2017, uh, I sold my um, JV consulting business for just over eight figures, semi-retired, uh, took a year out, uh, but now I'm back again uh, with what's happening in the, the current, uh, with the current pandemic. I want to try and help as many people as I can possible by um, uh, introducing them to the concept of joint venture partnerships. And also, like you said, the mindset in terms of how to achieve things and leverage what's around you. Obviously, because of the current conditions, things are very difficult and people see that as quite a, quite a high barrier for them to actually get over to start taking action and start making changes. In sure. What advice can you provide people to you'd say, mitigate that or try and manage that situation? At the moment, it is a troubling time for a lot of people, but I think you've got to look uh, really at the positive side of what's happening also. There are not lots of negativity uh, around, but uh, you've got to look at the positive sides in terms of where the leverage is and where the opportunities are right now. So mm -hmm. uh, the, one of the biggest opportunities we're seeing right now is the ability to uh, work together with other companies and other individuals as well. Everyone at the moment is open to doing partnerships to try and figure out and try and solve the current problems they're having, whether it's um, uh, personal 
whether it's business related. So right now there are current opportunities, but like I say, right now what we all should be doing is really helping as many people as we can. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, as you know, this is one of the things that I've done consistently for the last 15 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a there is a, a so there is a silver lining, um, uh, you know, out there. So I think more people just need to be aware of what's going on um, internally um, as well, and, and obviously build yourself up internally as well. Now is a good time to start sort of uh, working on yourself, you know, working on self-development, working on your mindset, for example, and obviously getting ready for when uh, we're out of the, the current lockdown. Because even though there are a lot of opportunities right now, there's going to be a lot of opportunities because the world ha has already changed. Mm. And um, there will be a lot of opportunities coming um, after the lockdown with all these changes. What's the first step that you would advise people to do when it comes to mindset change? Because mindset is, you could say, a bit of a dark art when, when you have a look at it. So what do you think is the first steps that somebody can take to start looking at how they can change their mindset and do basic self-development to actually start them down that road? I think the biggest thing for me has been having a belief system. Okay, When I lost everything back in 2008, I literally lost millions and, you know, I went from being a multimillionaire, totally broke. But one of the things for me was uh, having a strong belief system. And mm -hmm. I think you need to build a belief system, whether it's a religious belief system, whether it's an ideology, whether it's something based on, um, uh, on, on something that you have a personal connection with. Mm -hmm. a, a, a building a strong belief system is, I believe, is the first step towards having a really strong mindset because when things get taken away from you and there's so much chaos on the outside, you have the inert ability to be able to bring everything together internally if you have a very strong belief system. And that probably comes back to a lot of the, you could say, advice that's uh, going around about finding the reason <coughs> why you do things. And, and as you've said, quite accurately is making sure that resonates for you because it's got to be something very personal to you and it's got to be something that makes sense to you and, and as a core as you could say it's part of your being because if you don't yes. have that part of your being then your motivation is not going to be correct and it also is not going to carry you through the long term I think also like, you know, the mind is a powerful thing. So, you know, we, we, we use such a small capacity of the brain of the mind. So um, building your brain, building your uh, inner sort of mindset and um, understanding more about how things work and how you work internally uh, mm -hmm. is, is a very good thing to do on a regular basis. Because, you know, I say to people, I live in the confines of my mind, you know, when things, when things are falling apart around me, I have the you know, ability to be able to keep things together. And, um, you know, people always, um, they don't complain, but people always say to me, look, so hell, you're, you're always positive. You're always finding a positive out of a negative because that's what I do. And hmm. one of the, 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 the interesting things is, you know, when you ask someone the question, you know, how, how, how is your day or how are things going? People will say, oh, it's, it's okay. It's all right. But, you know, it's, you have to see that opportunity and seek that opportunity in every day. Now, it could be, Anything basic, for example, with me, I may say to someone, I've had an amazing day today because you know what? I had an amazing cup of coffee this morning. Okay. So such a small thing like that, that you can uh, create that, um, that feeling um, to give you that feeling of the day being successful. And, you know, I, I say to people, a lot of people, the problem is they focus on the negative things. They focus on the wrong things that are going on in their life. If you start focusing on the right things, and the positive things, there's always something positive in your day. So I think you need to really just zone in on that and, um, and have the ability to be able to create that feeling. So one of the things that I do and, uh, you know, on a regular basis is either with music, for example, that triggers a memory for me that's a happy memory. Mm. I will listen to music or I will um, do something that uh, makes me feel happy, for example. So I think people, you need to do that. So you don't necessarily need to have the big, the big house and the fancy cars and whatever it is, you know, they're materialistic things. There's things that you can do to create the same feeling of having something and enjoying something. So you've got to look at the little things in each every day that you do. And as you do those and you go along, you're not only with your mindset get stronger, but you'll have that inner ability to be able to switch off any negativity and turn it into a positive state 
very very quickly from that uh, from doing those activities do you find that this activity of actually reminding yourself or you could say recognizing having the awareness of the good things in your day-to-day -day life starts building up cumulatively and carries you through the rest of the uh, the day and also the rest of the week or it does it's, it's it's pretty amazing right because uh you know for example you what what happens is you're it, the way and it's really bizarre because i'd love to do more more of a study into what into how the brain works and how the brain triggers these um uh these feelings in your body because some of the things that i do for example allow me just to sit there and forget about everything if you've ever had that experience of where you're you're doing just one thing and that one thing is so enjoyable that it allows you to forget about everything that's going on in your life what if you could trigger that and that response and and have that response again and again and again in your life and i mean you know a lot, a lot of you might have seen that the um the movie limitless for example the mm. nzt you know the, the guy takes the pill and explodes his memory uh, and then he has the ability to do things and bypass those uh, neural networks that um that 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 produce those negative thoughts or produce those negative actions what if there was a way that you could um ultimately have those positive positive experiences every day by doing that so you know it's something that i recommend people doing and, and keeping a diary as well and writing in a, a diary in terms of uh, what caused that experience for you because we go through we go through this whole dynamic in our lives now for example i have kids you know when i watch my kids play in the garden they're just carefree you know they, they aren't they aren't worried about what's going on in the world they, yeah. they they you know they don't have mortgages to pay they don't have bills they're just carefree because what they're doing is ultimately uh, um you know uh, making them laugh making them enjoy their day um and then they have certain things that they like to do that that triggers that so you know they already have something they have already have an activity that they enjoy the most out of several activities so it's just really important it's just really interesting for me because i'm always looking into the dynamics of how you know how these things work and and, and what triggers people to to make them happy so um i think more of that in terms of um uh, on a rep uh, a rep and, and a repetition and doing that regularly is something that really, really solidifies and really strengthen your mindset. What you've actually highlighted are some interesting things with regards to uh, getting into that state of mind as the reference also is a, a something called the state of flow. And there's a lot of research which has come out of it. There's a couple of books which uh, I recommend to everyone when they start talking about the state of flow, which is uh, Rise of Superman by Stephen Kotler and Jamie Will. And then there's uh, that, yeah. yeah stealing fire, and they basically unpick the whole aspect of state of flow and how it actually works and how the principles that lead to state of flow and how you can actually be a lot more aware of it to be able to trigger a state of flow and actually get into that stage where you're super focused and you're really being creative and able to shut off a lot of negative thought processes. But it comes down to being very aware and very focused and making sure that you uh, continually working on something which you find enjoyment uh, slightly challenging but it, it ties into all of the aspects that the brain uses like the novelty factor which feeds into dopamine releases and it's slightly challenging so you're working at it which means your focus is, is very very pinpointed on actually doing the activity which means you're so engaged with it that time more or less becomes you become unaware of time they are fantastic books for anybody that is actually looking into uh, learning a lot more and stephen kotler has got some introductory courses to them which are really very good i've done a couple of them and they they're well worth doing the other aspect that you mentioned about keeping a diary ties into something which uh, the, the brain can trick you in remembering things inaccurately a lot of the times, or it, it has a preference based on, you could say, whether you're a lot more positive, whether you're negative, these psychological aspects can actually influence whether, how you remember things and which ones are, are preferred. By actually writing down, it means that you're negating in, inaccurate memories, which means if you've built up enough positive 
memories and keep a record of them and you go back to them, then it ties into some things that you mentioned is that automatic recall that ties into the emotions and all of the positive feelings and the positive outlooks, which is where it starts building cumulatively. By actually writing things down like that, it means that you're keeping a history of positive action and it actually gives you that, you could say, long-term benefits of, uh, of wanting to be positive. And it also means that you, you don't have to generate a positive feeling you're using your recollection and you basically got the evidence, which means that you're not lying to yourself. You're actually accurately replaying memories and it makes it a lot easier for you to stay positive in a, in a very difficult uh, situation, which I think was, uh, are all very valuable uh, pieces of advice which you've uh, highlighted there. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a very powerful thing. Uh, and for me, I, I have the ability to do that, but on a short-term basis. So mm -hmm. everyone has down days, and I do have down days. I mean, I probably have one down day every 30 days, and I, 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 it, it does register with me. So, but I can quickly uh, adapt myself and uh, re-switch, uh, put that switch back on, which allows me to do something different. So it's just really interesting. You know, I don't normally talk about this sort of stuff. I'm always about business and how to grow a business mm. and how to be successful, and blah, blah, blah. But I think this part of um, some of the stuff that I do um, is, uh, is interesting because, you know, it's, it's so powerful. It's so powerful. And, you know, it allows me to do things um, uh, in life because I have that belief system that, you know, it, I, I believe that I would never fail basically. Mm. Um, you know, I have this sort of idea that what could I do if I knew I could never fail? Now I have failed in the past. Okay. But I don't call it failure. For me, it's basically, it's a learning experience. So, and I, and I like to fail fast. If I'm doing something, I would always say, and one of my mentors actually taught me that. So, you know, if you're, if you're going to fail, fail fast so you can mm. move on. So a failure is a good thing. It's, it, it's a learning experience. And I think everyone needs to go through that because you need to go through that experience to make yourself much stronger and uh, be more adaptive in terms of what gets thrown at you. Um, so, uh, yeah, n d never be afraid of, of, of failing or, or, or failure. And uh, that brings me on to uh, something very um, interesting because my belief system is based on my religion. So mm -hmm. my religion teaches me that this world is a temporary space. Uh, we don't uh, belong in this world. We're just here as beings, basically. Um, uh, and our souls, when we die, we live on forever in, in the afterlife. So um, that gives me the ability to also say, look, whatever I do in this life, whether I succeed or fail, it doesn't really matter because that is not really the reason I'm here. The reason I'm here is to do as much good as I can and take that good with me so it, I transcend to a better place. Um, whether, you know, with the, with the belief of heaven and hell, basically. Mm. So I think uh, a belief system like that has really helped me. I've been in life and death situations where I've sat down and I thought to myself, look, I've had a great life. Uh, if, and I always say to people, if I, if I passed away today, um, I would have no regrets because I've had an amazing life. And that my mindset has allowed me to go out and do crazy stuff, to go out and do things and not, not worry about whether I'm going to succeed or fail because for me, it's like, um, uh, it, it, it's what I do basically. And, you know, mm. I'm all about uh, doing stuff uh, and, uh, you know, going out and doing as much as I can because of that idea that, you know, what, what would I do if I, if I knew I could never fail? So that again, comes all down to your mindset. Mm. Um, and you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, um, what is the word they say, you know, be, being in your comfort zone. Uh, and that's another thing, you know, what is your comfort zone? Is there really a comfort zone or have you not adapted or, or has you, have you not adapted to be able to do anything? So if you have the ability to do anything uh, without failing, then there is no comfort zone. OK, so I, I think a lot of people talk about staying in your comfort zone and that's what it's. A, but we're people don't realize how amazing we are as human beings, the ability to do things, the ability to adapt. OK. And we've been doing it for millions of years. You know, we, we've been adapting as much as we can and we're always adapting. So I think this thing about the comfort zone is complete BS. I think there is no comfort zone. It's, it's, it's what you call it, basically, you know, and it's like mm. you are you have the ability to adapt to any situation because the body learns, you know, your, your brain learns, your body learns. And look at some of the amazing things that people are doing around the world and they can do. And, you know, you'll say to yourself, oh, I could never do that. But they're the same as you. They have you know, two arms, two legs. You know, they have a human body. They've just gone through the process of learning how to become like that. 
but it doesn't make them any different. They're not superhuman. They're not, you know, mutants. They're, they don't have four legs or, and six arms. So I think that's, you know, that's, a, that's the thing that a lot of people, um, uh, they believe and that keeps them back by saying, look, that's out of my comfort zone. I wouldn't do that. Um, but hey, you know, give it a try. That's what I say. I think you've highlighted some really interesting aspects, which I think gives another a good insight into it, especially when it comes to your religious belief system about, you know, this is only temporary, which means it, it removes a certain amount of fear, which is associated with being alive. Correct. Yes. So you've removed, you could almost say that restriction, which means it opens up a whole new world of, you could say possibilities where previously, if you think I'm restricted, I'm only going to be alive or I'm restricted by this, my vine, my opportunities, friends, family, everything else. Yeah. You start limiting yourself. Yes. Intentionally. And, 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 unnecessarily. And, and, yeah. That's right. And again, it's a belief system. You know, when I lost everything, everything, I looked at myself and I thought, okay, what am I really here for? You know, am I really here to accumulate you know, um, uh, uh, you know, materialistic assets. Am I here to accumulate cars and houses and w what is it? What am I really here for? You know, and then after that, you know, that for me was an aha moment. My whole perception on life changed because I, I, luckily for me, when I was younger, I'd been through that phase. And, you know, I had, a, I, had a, I had a massive ego when I was younger. You know, I wanted to be the king of the world. You know, I wanted to, <laughs> to, to, to own everything and have everything. You know, I lived in a 15-bedroom in a, in a, in a uh, mansion. I had Ferraris and Porsches uh, in the drive. And luckily for me, I did that when I was a lot younger. And mm. I went through that phase. And it, and I, it made me realize that that's not really, you know, the, the be all end all. That's not really why I'm here. So um, uh, that, that made me want to not be attached uh, too much to, to, to certain things, basically, you know, having the attachment uh, and having the ability not to have that attachment. And then my religious belief kicked in as well. And I thought to myself, you know what, if I can do more good in the world and, uh, and you know, one of my mottos is, has always been give first, ask later. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's not about the money anymore. I don't, I don't necessarily need the money, but if I can do whatever I can, to help other people with the skills and the background that I have, um, that really does, does make me happy. So I tend to always keep doing that and always keep delivering as much as I can, um, helping other people uh, around me. So, uh, and it, it, you know, it's been a great journey. And right now where we are in this current crisis, it's even uh, needed more than ever. So, mm. um, so I'm happy and grateful for that. I'm ha happy and grateful for the experience, to be honest with you, of going through that experience that I, I would never have that, mindset where i am today um and having that ability to uh, be able to do the things that i do now so you've also highlighted something else which i've come to realize uh, as well is that instead of restricting to good and bad and you start looking at everything from a, from a perspective of learning it changes a lot of the dynamics of how you actually approach something because it's no no longer you're no longer using that judgment whether something is good or bad, you're just processing it on an informational level almost and what you can learn out of it, which removes a certain amount of restriction and gives you a lot more ability to be creative in everything that you do. Yeah, and it's, it's quite amazing. You know, I've, I've studied a lot of things. I mean, when I was younger, I studied, I studied other religions as well. So, mm. you know, I studied, uh, the, you know, the Torah, the Bible. Um, uh, I even studied, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Sikh religion, uh, the Hinduism. So I did a lot of studying when I was younger to see what people's interpretation was of, you know, the, the, the path and life. And it's just been really interesting for me to understand more about, really it's just it, it it comes down to the same sort of message uh, across the board really in terms of people always ask you know what is why are we here what is my mission in life what's my purpose and um it's just really interesting but the mindset thing i really really um enjoy because it it it, it just gives you the ability to create your own world inside your brain which is quite interesting because mm. you can we can be in a complete shutdown, a complete lockdown, but I can carry on living um, uh, successfully in, in the space between my ears, basically. So, um, you know, it gives me the ability to be able to, uh, to, to, be able to expand more in terms of uh, my thinking and my mindset. So it is a strong thing. I mean, for example, I mean, 
I, I, I can only imagine, um, um, you know, the, the, the chap, um, I forgot his name now, from, who, is, who is in prison in South Africa. Um, Nelson Mandela. Yes, of course. You know, how many years was he confined in a space? And how strong was this guy's mindset, you know? And when he came out from prison, he was pretty much untouched, you know, because, uh, you know, his, the, the body withers, but the brain somehow seems to get stronger. So it, it's quite amazing what you can achieve, um, I guess, you know, in terms of um, if you really put your mind to it. And if you have that, again, the belief system, you know, the focus, that such, that such strong belief that it doesn't shake anything around you. So it, this is, it's, just some, it's some amazing stuff um, that, uh, you know, I think more people need to really, really start looking into and um, applying as well uh, to themselves in, in daily life. I think you've highlighted a really valuable part of it, which is the, the concept and your identity when you start transcending it from just something ordinary into something that is a complete or a lot bigger concept means that regardless of the situation that you're in, you're always going to have that overarching belief system or concept that you're working towards. You're not going to be, yes, you might have challenges and it doesn't mean that you'll never have to deal with challenges. It just means that the challenges are not going to be as restricting and long-term as what a lot of people think problems are. It was the same thing with the 2008 with the property crash and the financial meltdown. Yes, there was a massive, massive impact. But if you start looking at it over a long period of time and your belief system is such a, that it's only going to be a period in time, then it changes your dynamics and it means that you can start working towards something which is going to happen, start helping you to solve problems and get to the, the next stage of your life. And, you know, life carries on and people do more and, you know, there's this there's creative and fantastic things that happened out of it. Yes, it wasn't very easy and a lot of people you know, were impacted with it. But again, it's, it's how you approach it and how you view it. Now, the, you've also relied on uh, mentors when you were, uh, as you've gone through your life, but you also ended up writing a book with Jay Conrad and Levitin. How did that come about? That was really interesting. You know, I was part of a, a, um, a huge mastermind uh, in the U.S. called the Winner Circle, a $25,000 mastermind a year. And um, we were invited on a, a mastermind cruise and uh, two speakers were there. One was Michael Gerber from the E-Myth and one was J. Corey Levinson the, from Guerrilla Marketing. And, um, you know, my aim was to basically connect with these two um, uh, thought leaders. And, you know, I'm really good at connecting with people. One of the things that I'm really good at is, is making introductions and, uh, as you know, joint venture partnerships. Mm. So Michael Gerber was basically impossible to get a hold of. He had an entourage, security. He would come in uh, and, and, and do a, a small speech and then he would disappear and, and you wouldn't see him again after that. Whereas Jay Conrad Levinson was someone who would sit there with the audience and with people and just tell stories all day long. So I didn't really want to be seen as a groupie. So one day I met him in the, um, in the, in the lounge area and I said, to, I said to JJ, I know you're very busy and a lot of people want to talk to you. Is it possible for us to just sit down and you know, have, a, have a cup of tea or coffee and just have a quick chat? And he said, yeah, sure, no problem. So I walked off and then in the evening um, uh, at the, in the dinner hall, we were told not to disturb the VIP guests. And he basically called me over sat me down next to his family, introduced me to his family. And, you know, we ended up talking, having dinner together. And that's when I told him about this book that I was in the process of writing. And he said, look, send it to me. Let me have a look at it. Email me back and said, hey, this sounds great. We should do this together. And obviously the relationship started then. He became mm. one of my mentors. And uh, we finished the book basically just before he passed away. So he passed away in 2014. A few months before that, we completed the book. He passed away. And then it took me basically a year to convince his family to law to release the book because it was the last book from J. Conrad mm -hmm. Levinson. And uh, we were very fortunate. The book was launched, became an international uh, best-selling hit. And um, the book's been responsible for uh, millions of dollars of, of business for me. So I'm very, very fortunate and grateful again uh, to be in that position. And um, I'm always... Uh, I'm always happy when people reach out to me on Facebook or LinkedIn and say, wow, you know, I read your book and this is what I did. This is what I implemented. And would you like a testimonial? And I like to invite you on, like you say, you know, to a podcast mm -hmm. or to an interview and, and to, to talk more about the book and about, you know, joint ventures. So it's been great. It's been a really, really good platform for me 
to get me into some uh, amazing um, uh, uh, things that I've done uh, over the last couple of years. So yes, again, very grateful for that. That's excellent. So when it comes to advice that you can give people, when you actually say teaching something to your, to your kids, how do you approach it to be able to give people a, a different perspective or a different view on one life and two looking at how to solve problems? Okay, that's very easy because one of the things that, that I got taught from one of my first mentors, which was my father, bless him, who's, who's passed away uh, many years ago, was you always put yourself in other people's shoes, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I think a lot of people aren't successful in terms of what they do because they only think about themselves, okay? Mm -hmm. And they look at other people as, you know, as money or dollar, mm -hmm. dollar signs. So one of the reasons why I'm so successful in this field is that I always put myself in the other person's shoes. So I would always ask the question, what would I do if I was put in that same situation? So, you know, I do the same thing and I try and do the same thing with my kids. And I say, look, just think about, you know, if, if, if you were in that position or if you are put in that situation, what would you do? So whenever you're doing something or whether you're, uh, you're, you're selling or you're, you're, you're networking or you're, um, you're, you're getting together or whatever, always think to yourself, okay, if, if I did something like that, uh, what would that other person think? So that's one of the secrets I think of my success is the having the ability to put myself in someone else's shoes and reacting to that at the same time. Now in, in NLP, they call it a, a, something similar. They call it mirroring, mm -hmm. which is, which is very similar to mirroring. You know, you're basically, um, you're, 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 you're adapting to the person that you're talking to. But mine, I think goes one step further because I, I put myself in their shoes to think about how would they react? Uh, if, if I approached it this way. And that has been, for me, very successful in, in closing not only a lot of deals, but a lot of um, uh, sales uh, for, for a lot of things that I do. So I think that's one of the, the main things that I would say has been very successful for me. And the other thing I think you, you've mentioned before is that you also pay attention very carefully when you actually listen to people i think you mentioned it before you've got uh, is it hearing loss in, in the one one ear? yeah I'm, as you can see i only have one a a yeah. airpod here because i'm deaf in that ear so i yeah i'm totally deaf um i had a car a car accident many many years ago and uh, I, I broke a clavicle bone in my ear i had a couple of operations but it, it didn't really do anything so yeah I'm, I'm totally deaf in my left ear um, which is good for me because it, it gives me the ability from a distance I can uh, I have to lip read um, mm -hmm. uh, and that I tell you why that's really interesting because when I'm talking to someone I would look them in the face because I need to read their lips so a lot of people you know always say when you talk to someone look at someone when you talk to them that's the confidence thing mm -hmm. and partly confidence for me but also partly because sometimes I have to read the read a person's lips if they if there's a lot of people in a room and there's a lot of conversations going on, I have to have the ability to be able to read that person's lips just in case I miss anything. So, um, yeah, yeah, correct. Have you found that by being a lot more, you could say, required to pay attention to people and listen to people, that you can pick up on a lot of the subtle, you could say, reactions and intonations and also, uh, you could say, triggers or patterns or, or, or the way that people react for you to be able to be better mirror them and actually understand what it is that they're trying to say? Of course, but don't forget, I think one of the main things for me as an individual is also in terms of what I went through, you know, I, I lost mm. everything in 2008 and that really changed my whole outlook on life. So when I talk to people, it is more genuine. I don't have an agenda. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't um, have an agenda behind it. So I think when I talk to people, it comes out to be much more genuine. And yes, I do pick up a lot of patterns in terms of communic communication. And, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, 15, 20 years. So I know exactly what comes after and what comes before. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm always ready for that. And it's, it's something that I've learned and adapted to over the years that um, that allows me to do that. Just provide a couple of examples of the, the before and after. What is it, what is your, you could almost say your process, but also, you know, how, what is your approach when it comes to... Okay, that's, that's easy. So I always say to my students and my clients that there's two avenues 
in terms of communicating with anyone that you when you're in an environment especially mm -hmm. a business environment so the first one is always the icebreaker situation so if you're standing with someone and you want to start a conversation if their name is steve you say oh hi steve um so tell me a bit more about how you got started as a i don't know whatever it is accountant or as a doctor or mm. as a, a roofer or whatever so when you ask that question you're now being interested in that person and people always like other people who are interested in them you know mm. as human beings we, we 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 often love to talk about ourselves you know we love it when someone shows an interest in us and that's just a, a human a, a, a psychological factor so mm. that's the that's the number one sort of question that i would, would always approach with and then when they've actually told me about what they do my next question is always okay so that's great that sounds really good so tell me how can i help you uh, sell more of your product or service or how can i help you uh, uh, be more successful in business what is it you need and that's what i do i never pitch i never say okay well you know i've got this i've got that i've got this mm -hmm. you should buy this i always ask just those two basic questions and then that person will tell you exactly what they're after they'll tell you what they need they'll tell you what their pains are and their problems are and if you can solve that then you have permission to tell them, okay, that sounds great because you know what? I think I can really help you or I can't help you, but guess what? There's somebody else in this room that I want to introduce you to that can help you. So I do a lot of that stuff. I do a lot okay. of introductions. Uh, I'll be the, I'll be the guy in the room introducing everyone. And then at the end of the event or end of the, um, whatever it is, people will remember me and they'll say, you remember that guy? So hell, you know, he's the JV guy, you know, he puts people together and then people reach out to me and then they'll say to me, so what do you have anything? What do you, what do you have? So hell, do you have a course or do you have a program? I'd really be interested in attending it. And that's how most of my business comes nowadays. You know, I do, uh, it's, it's a lot of, um, uh, inbound, um, uh, uh, requests that come rather than me going out there pitching my business. And, uh, you know, I've, I, I never have a lack of, of business from doing that. No advertising whatsoever. I've never done any advertising for the last sort of 10, 15 years. And that is basically how I approach it. That's an interesting approach because it changes a lot of the uh, dynamics. Um, there's, I'm trying to think of, of, of the, uh, it's something that I uh, they came across when I was interviewing Tim Warren, uh, which he was talking about how he changed his practice because he was uh, dealing with patients on a day-to-day -day basis. He's a chiropractor and he's, he coaches and deals with a lot of people that have got uh, long-term or chronic back pain, pain issues, especially, obviously, because the U.S. has got a big opioid uh, crisis issue. Yes. And oh, wow. yeah. the, the one thing that he learned is that when he changed his method of um, engaging with people to more of a Socratic method by asking questions and actually waiting for them to volunteer information. It meant that people were a lot more willing to participate and they were a lot more committed to actually doing something because you are asking for the, for the person's input and you're asking for the person to potentially tell them or tell you what they need to do to actually solve their problem. And most people actually know that information already. They've just got to have an avenue of being able to talk about it and verbalize it and start finding a solution to it themselves, just as long as you give them enough time to actually do that and open themselves up and become engaged with the process. And I think that's probably where a lot of the value lies in what you do is that you give people enough time to actually talk about themselves and verbalize some of their challenges, things that they deal with and, and you're asking the, the other person to potentially come up with a solution and you're giving the person permission to actually come up either with ideas or suggestions or a way that they can solve their own problem without trying to project your own way of potentially solving a problem. You're waiting for the person to come out and suggest something themselves. Have you found that a lot of people have come away and said, look, I've had this really good idea. What do you think about it? I get that all the time. You know, I get, I get pitched every day uh, and it happens on a regular basis, but it's interesting because, you know, you, you, you build some good relationships from that. And like, mm. you know, I have a, I have a network of joint venture brokers. I've trained over a couple of hundred of them over the last sort of 10 years. Um, you know, I do a boot camp every quarter in Las Vegas, uh, teaching people how to be joint venture brokers. And um, uh, it, it's good for me because it gives me the ability to feed those uh, requests uh, to my team. Mm. And, 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 you know, give them the business. So yeah, it's, it's a good thing. So 
your one of the main things that I you know, get out of that is that uh, your belief system carries in with it. It gives you a lot of, you could say, a different perspective, but also the fact that you've got this ability to connect with people. And obviously, because people are so social, by being interested in other people, it obviously makes you a lot more approachable and, and people are a lot more willing to trust you because of being willing to listen to them and actually asking for their uh, you know, interests and inputs and uh, you know, ask about them, which is really an important thing. But also the willingness to learn from each, you could say, engagement and customer and actually finding out about them. What have you learned from engaging with all of the the partners your team members and your jb brokers and also your 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 customers what's one of the big things that you come out from from each engagement i think everyone has a different need you have to treat each individual separately so mm -hmm. what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for another person so it's all about asking the right questions and i think you have to ask questions and keep asking questions until you come to those solutions and those answers um, but at the same time, also the, having the ability to keep quiet and let the other person talk, because people will tell you what their uh, what their problems are. People will tell you what they need. So, you know, you've got to really just listen. And uh, if you can match that um, solution with that problem, then it's always going to be easy to make a sale, or it's always going to be easy to close business. So, those that's probably one of the fundamental things that I've learned about. You having the ability to understand and communicate um, with uh, with people. The, the just diving into the topic about questions. So of course, questioning is a skill in itself, because you obviously get the open close questions, and I take it a lot of your questioning comes from learning how to question people or how to ask questions of, of people to actually get them to to share information. So what was the key thing that you've learned with regards to asking people questions to help them engage and also open up uh, so that you can actually learn something from them or actually understand what it is that they need is because actually identifying the need behind what the actual information is very, very, a, a, you would say a refined skill so how's your your you could say your ability to question being able to identify those needs okay one of the things that i do a lot with people is i ask personal questions also so i don't okay. just mix questions in terms of the uh, the answers i'm trying to get i try and delve deeper into building a relationship with someone so they say in business that people do business with people they like. And yeah. I, I found that 150% correct because that's what I tend to do. You know, I, I tend to myself do business only with people I like and vice versa. So for me, asking the right questions is not only the, uh, the, the fundamental thing, but it's how you ask the questions, I think, also. And uh, I try and I, I always try and want to build a connection with the people I'm talking to. So I do sprinkle some personal questions in there. And um, even better if you've got uh, similar uh, interests. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you can find a similar interest in terms of asking the right questions with that individual, that always helps as well. So that's all for really, really good advice. So how, so what's, what's next on your, on your roadmap uh, and what you want to achieve then? That's a good question. You know, if you asked me that question a couple of years ago, I would have said, I'm done. You know, <laughs> I'm, I've, I've sold up. I'm now semi-retired and I'm just going to spend my time you know, lying in a hammock somewhere. But, you know, I, for me, it was, uh, I think I've just got much more to, to offer the world. And uh, one thing I'm focusing on right now is um, really ramping up the, the brokering side of everything, teaching people how to basically get control of, of assets that they don't own and have the ability to make money from those assets. And what I'm seeing right now in the world, people are losing their jobs, people are losing their businesses. You know, I, I want to show people that there is a way to leverage um, other people's resources and assets as a middleman, as a broker, uh, and to be able to make money and no longer spend the years building something only to lose it. So I'm really, really working hard on launching a new um, uh, brokering uh, certification program uh, very mm -hmm. soon. Um, which is my learn to broker program. I've just set up a new channel on YouTube called how to broker with the number two. Uh, okay. So I'm working on really building that as an educational platform 
um, putting a lot of educational content on there for people who want to learn more about how to become um, you know, joint venture brokers or even brokering luxury assets. Um, one thing I do offer to people, if it's okay for you to mention, yeah. if you want access to all my training programs, which I've put online, um, over twenty over twenty five thousand dollars worth of training, go to um, jointventuremastermind.com. And uh, if you go to that site, you can get access to all my training for free if you join my mastermind. Um, and we're doing some loads of really cool stuff. You know, we've, we've just launched a, a joint venture platform uh, to help people um, uh, rec- go out and request JV partners. But I think the brokering thing is I- I'm doing more of that at the moment and I- I'm launching. Um, and, and for me, it's always been focus. Um, you know, one of my mentors, has always said to me, focus on one thing and become a master at that, and only then you go into the next. But for me, it's always just been one thing, which is joint ventures, and I've mm. been focusing on that for the last 15, 20 years, become the best in the world at it. Um, I, I waited for someone to take over the mantle, and I, I, I stepped down for a year, and no one turned up, and I came back into the scene. So, um, so it's interesting. But my students, you know, they, they still they still want me around, so that, that's a good thing. And uh, that's it, really, just focusing on um, giving people the ability to be able to do some really, really cool things, but without having the liability of um, owning, uh, you know, a, a business or having employees or having staff or, uh, or or being in a situation that they're in now, you know, having to shut shop mm-hmm. because their product is not viable anymore. Um, uh, uh, whereas with what we've been doing, you know, it's pretty much a recession proof business, you know, for the last 15, 20 years we have the ability to carry on doing business just by leveraging other people's assets and resources. So that's really my main aim to show more people how to become successful at doing that and, and becoming basically middlemen billionaires. So. And that's really key because you're creating a community of people that are willing to help each other. And at the end of Correct. the day, businesses, you know, will always want to do business with other people if it, if it means that they can benefit out of it, but it also means that, you're developing a, a trust within the group that's uh, that you know is always going to be to the benefit of everybody. We're not just a single person or a single business, which I think is an admirable approach to how how to do something or how to uh, get get people engaged. Because people want yeah. to trust other people, they want to build communities. It's part of you could say human DNA and their nature, and you know how how things develop and. To, to be able to do it in a way where you know you can trust the other person and it's going to be to the benefit of both, then it means that uh, it's going to always have, have a positive outcome for everybody in that regard. Great. Excellent. So, Hel, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate the interview. And uh, it's, been, uh, it's been some fantastic insights into it. And I uh, look forward to speaking with you soon. Cheers. Thank you. When you support and review a podcast like this from someone like Lance, it gains more visibility and motivates him to produce more. What topics most interest you? The best topic gains a shout out on the podcast.